Hi, good morning. My name is Irene Kim. I'm a member of the Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Division at UCLA in the Department of Head and Neck Surgery. Um, and I'm very privileged today to speak to you about the topic of facial reanimation, a comprehensive treatment for facial paralysis. We say comprehensive because we like to take a multidisciplinary approach here at UCLA with all of uh, the neurosurgeons, the otologists, the audiologists, and various other groups that make it possible to provide you, the patient, with the best, most well-rounded treatment plan. Please ask questions on Twitter if you have any using hashtag UCLAMDChat or comment on Facebook. So a little background about myself, uh, I did um, go to Johns Hopkins University for college and jo Johns Hopkins for medical school and then after that I came back to California to uh, complete a head and neck surgery residency at UCLA and then I pursued a subspecialty fellowship in facial plastic and reconstructive surgery at Johns Hopkins with an emphasis on facial paralysis surgery. Uh, the goals for our um, uh, surgery uh, talk today is to one, discuss facial paralysis. What is it um, and what are the causes for it? Number two, we want to talk about what we consider the reversible or acute causes of facial paralysis and then discuss the irreversible or perhaps long-standing causes of facial paralysis because the treatment options can vary depending on what type of paralysis you might have. Number three, we want to talk about reanimating the face in a top-down approach, meaning we think about the eye first, then we look at the rest of the face and the smile, and that way we can really take care of the entire face as a whole. And we want to touch upon the differences between a st static and dynamic facial uh, reanimation procedures. There are many different ways uh, to do the same thing, and so various physicians have different opinions and different styles. They all work fairly well, and so it really um, is a matter of patient preference and also what the surgeon's recommendations are. And of course, we also want to talk about Botox, filler, and other aesthetic procedures that can really enhance your look. Um, you know, facial paralysis patients forget to remember that they are also prone to aging. And so things like chemical peels, laser, these are all um, avenues that we can take to enhance your look further. So this is a universal fa uh, pain assessment score. And so what this is, this is a scale that was devised to help patients who may have lower communication skills. Uh, assess, help the nurses assess what their pain level might be in the hospital. And what is kind of interesting about this is that you have six circles, the eyes and the noses are exactly the same, but one can tell that the person on uh, your left is very happy and content, whereas the person on the right is obviously in a lot of pain and discomfort. And really the only parameters that have changed are the positions of the eyebrows and the position of the lips. And this, this is a cartoon, and yet you and I, we can both determine that if a child were to draw that face on the very right, you would know that the child is in pain. And if the child were to draw a face in the middle, they might feel neutral. And so it's very powerful how our brain can see certain shapes and lines and determine or gauge what that person might be feeling. In the same vein, this is a picture, um, a collage of six pictures, which shows uh, different human emotions. And again, without me having to express and describe each one, you're probably able to understand that there's a multitude of emotions presented here. Everything from sadness to disgust to surprise and also happiness. And so the one that I want to focus in on is this gentleman in the bottom center. You know, he's got an upturned smile, he has nice smile lines, and his eyes look like they're, they're happy. And so there's a common thread among us. I think we can see a face and determine what kind of emotion that person is trying to convey or is conveying to us. So again, the smile, this collage just shows a number of people smiling, um, different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different jobs, and yet we can all infer from this photo that everybody in each of these honeycomb pictures is happy or is content. And so one thing we want to talk about is that the smile is universally understood. It's universally understood and it really denotes happiness, it denotes laughter, and it denotes sociability. 
And on top of that, it's quite contagious and it sustains our interpersonal relationships. So you can imagine that if your smile is impacted because of facial paralysis, a lot of these quality of life measures may be affected ne negatively. And this was a, a cartoon of a man. Um, I've covered up the left side of his face. And when you look at just the right side of his face, you can see that he looks like the average Joe walking on the street. He looks neutral, content maybe. And when I take away this barrier and show you um, him with facial paralysis, you might now have a different perception of this individual. You may think that he's sad. You might think he had a stroke. You might think that he's unhappy or maybe not approachable. And so you can see that with paralysis, you can certainly project an image that you were not really feeling on the inside. This is a study uh, that was done at Johns Hopkins. I know there's a lot of words on this screen, um, but really the most important part of the study is the conclusion. And what Dr. Ishii and her team um, concluded was that facial reanimation surgery increases attractiveness and decreases negative facial perception of patients with facial paralysis. The data emphasized the need to optimize reanimation surgery to restore not only function, but also symmetry and cosmesis to improve facial perception and patient quality of life. And so more studies are forthcoming, but what this tells us is that patients with facial paralysis do suffer worse quality of life. And so that is something that we really take into consideration when we counsel you about the types of procedures that we would recommend for you. So really, let's talk a little bit about what facial paralysis is and what causes facial paralysis. So you may already know, but facial paralysis is when one side or both sides of a face doesn't move as well as it should, and sometimes it doesn't move at all. And there are a multitude of causes. So everything from Bell's palsy, you may have heard uh, about Bell's palsy, uh, which is a viral infection. Uh, certainly you can have brain tumors that may be cancerous or not cancerous in the case of something like an acoustic neuroma. Uh, patients may have strokes and others may have parotid tumors. Still others might have something called iatrogenic injury, so they had a parotid surgery with another doctor perhaps, or a facelift surgery, and come in with a, with a palsy or a paralysis. Um, some patients come in with trauma. They fall while they're on the job. Uh, some of them have been stabbed, and so a lot of these patients will present with a traumatic history. Uh, there are other infections, and then of course there's there are syndromes like Mobius where children are born with facial paralysis. And so as you can see, they range and it takes really a number of experts to figure out why you have paralysis. So I want to touch briefly on Bell's palsy particularly because I think that's the condition most people are aware of. Um, it's a disorder of the nerve that controls the facial muscles and it is the number one cause of facial paralysis in the United States. So what I want to emphasize is that you are not alone. Many patients um, have had Bell's palsy and a lot of patients have recovered from Bell's palsy. Typically related to a viral infection, but it is a diagnosis of exclusion. And what that means is your healthcare doctor, your um, healthcare team, typically will get a set of labs, perhaps some imaging, um, and other uh, tests to determine that there is absolutely nothing else that's causing you the paralysis and to make sure that it is indeed due to this diagnosis of exclusion, Bell's palsy. The medical treatments are primarily with steroids and antiviral treatments, and surgery is not really a, a common avenue we, we take to help Bell's palsy. There are certain situations where we do decompress the nerve, um, but it's typically a self-resolving condition. And the prognosis is good for most people. I would say 85% fully recover, um, a 10% population will have partial recovery, and then there is a smaller group of patients who really don't have meaningful recovery. So we see a, a wide range of patients with different levels of paralysis uh, come into our office. So I want to talk a little bit um, about the facial nerve and kind of change gears a bit. So this is the facial nerve. Um, it takes a fairly convoluted route it starts in the brain and it takes a convoluted route going into the brain before it reaches the face and when it reaches the face it does branch into about five branches 
that then branch into smaller branches. And the final destination for these branches are the muscles of the face. And that's why the nerve acts to fire off signals to make the muscles of your eye blink, for you to smile, um, for you to be able to uh, grimace. A lot of these things, and pucker, these are motions and movements that are only done by the nerves moving these, these muscles. So this gentleman um, on your right side has a very dense facial paralysis of his left face. And you can see, we're not going to focus on, um, on um, the eye just yet. I want you to just take a look at him from the, from the eye down. And what you can tell right away is, wow, did he have a stroke? It seems very, very flaccid, almost like things have just started drooping quite a bit. And I think that's what most patients say when they come into the office. I just look like I've had a stroke. I feel very, very droopy. And so on first glance, of course, the asymmetry is profound, but really there's more to facial paralysis than just the way you might appear. There are a lot of functional problems that you might have. For example, in a patient um, who cannot close their eye or blink, you'll keep the cornea dry. And so imagine going to bed or being somewhere where it's very windy and not being able to close your eye the cornea does desiccate or get dried out and you could have long-term problems with your vision. And so that's an important problem that we try to address very early on with facial reanimation surgery. In the mid face, what, what you end up seeing is a little bit of an effacement or an erasure of the nasal labial fold. And so you get this flattening of the mid face and that contributes to nasal obstruction. And so that's another problem that we have. And then the lower third, with the droop that you have, uh, many patients complain of oral incompetence, meaning when they're talking with their friends or having lunch, they're constantly wiping their mouth because they're drooling, food is being sucked up into a bulge here under their uh, cheek, and they're not able to chew well, they're biting their gums, and they're having a hard time speaking. So there are a lot of different issues that, are, that arise with uh, facial paralysis um, on a functional level. So again, the eye, the nose, and the lower, um, the lower third. So I wanted to talk a little bit about eye protection. We find it to be really, really important here at UCLA when we have a patient who um, uh, is diagnosed with facial paralysis after procedures. We are called very early, uh, almost one or one day sometimes two days after the surgery, and we do try to implant a weight right away. So this is something we don't sit on for a week or two weeks or a month. And um, I want you to see this picture on the left. There's a gentleman who's trying to close his eyes, and you can see that he has great closure of his left eye, but you can see that his right eye is wide open. And so you can imagine if you're sleeping and that eye is wide open, you can certainly tape and you can use ointment, but there will be times when that eye will be exposed. And so you're really exposing it to the dangers of dry air, dust, um, and other uh, potential you know, triggers for injury. So what we do is we place weights into the eyelid. Um, at UCLA, we use a combination of gold and platinum. I primarily use platinum because it is a higher density, lower profile weight, meaning when people see you from afar, they're less likely to notice a, a platinum weight than a gold weight. Um, but we primarily use platinum here at UCLA. And it's a very um, straightforward procedure that lasts less than an hour. And it can be performed in the clinic or in the procedure room, depending on your comfort level. What I want you to notice about this patient on, the, on, the, on your left is that not only does he have a problem with blinking, but you can see that his lower eyelid is fairly lax meaning instead of being nice and taut, touching the eyeball, it's sort of beginning to sag a bit. And that's a big problem because that also contributes to inability to close the eye. It also contributes to this appearance of paralysis. So in those situations, we can do a number of procedures. These are all just terms for doing the same thing, which is to tighten the lower lid. And when we do these procedures, what you see is that here you have this uh, lax lower eyelid and over on your right side you can see that the lower eyelid is very well approximated to the globe okay and then on this screen what you see is that before the eyelid weight he had inability to close his eye and now he has full eye closure so you can see there's a big difference with performing very simple outpatient procedures procedures that you go home right after um, and you can see that there's a, a massive improvement in not only function but also the way they appear 
So this is a chart that simplifies paralysis, um, and perhaps it's an oversimplification, but I think it's great to discuss this with patients um, so that we can broadly categorize paralysis. So when I think of paralysis and a patient comes to the door, I think of two main categories. The first category being, okay, is this reversible and acute, or is this not reversible and long-standing? What I mean by that is, if a patient comes in reversible or acute paralysis, that person's facial nerve was happily going about its day, minding its own business, moving the muscles, doing a great job, and something happened to it acutely. Whether that was an injury from surgery, whether that was tra trauma, perhaps violent crime, stab wound, um, a number of different things. And so when that happens, uh, the nerve is not continuous or the nerve is so traumatized that it does not send the signals to the muscle to move. And in those cases, we can either repair the nerves uh, at that time end to end, and if the nerves are on tension when we try to close, we can put a little graft in the middle to try to close uh, the gap that, that exists, or we can bring in nerves from other places to power that facial nerve. In long-standing or not reversible paralysis, what you typically have are patients who are either born with paralysis or perhaps have had paralysis for many, many years. And in those cases, the nerves and the muscles have really atrophied quite a bit. And so in those situations, no matter how much neural input you provide, the end point, which are your facial muscles, aren't really going to move clinically significantly. And so in those cases, we bring in muscle from other places to try to help move your mouth, try to help move your eye. And those are the main differences that I see. And we try to tailor the recommendations to you and your loved ones based upon what kind of a story you have and what you've been through. So we're going to focus a little bit right now on just the acute or reversible paralysis. One of the things um, that I want to mention that is that uh, back in the day, years ago, people were told, uh, people with facial paralysis were told there's nothing we can do, there's, you have to kind of live with it, you have to adapt. It's not really true. We really believe that everyone can benefit from treatment. Um, and so that's why we urge you to come in for a consultation with a facial plastic surgeon so that they may be able to guide you. Um, we want to treat earlier, earlier, earlier. There's no use in waiting. We really, really want to see you very early on. And what that means is we want you to tell us that you're having surgery. We want to know you before you even go in for your surgeries. That way we can prepare you for what might happen, what types of procedures you might need down the road. And if you're going to have a parotid um, tumor excision or you're having an acoustic neuroma excision, it might be wise for your cancer surgeon or your neurosurgeon to get us involved if they're concerned that the nerve might be impacted. And one of my mentors at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Kofi Bohin, always used to say time is muscle. So really, the longer you wait, the, longer the, the bigger the chances you have of causing that muscle to atrophy. So that's something important to know. And of course, we like to do dynamic options. So although there are lots of ways to accomplish a goal, dynamic options means that you're able to do something to cause movement for yourself. So it's a volitional type of movement, not where you're suspended at all times. So this is that drawing again of the facial nerve. Um, what I want to explain is this. Um, when I talk to my patients about the facial nerve, I explain it as though the facial nerve is like a factory. The brain is like the boss of the factory, the muscles of your face are like the workers of the factory, and the facial nerves are like the telephone lines. So the brain calls the, the workers to get them to work through these telephone lines. So if you imagine somebody is stabbed in the face, somebody has a gunshot wound, or there's an injury during a parotid surgery, the brain is just fine, the muscles of the face are just fine, but the telephone lines are down. So in these situations, what we do is we try to repair the telephone lines or the facial nerves themselves. So what do we do? We go to the operating room and we can actually physically connect the ends of these nerves using sutures that are finer than hair under a microscope and we can try to connect the nerves for you. Now, what about in a situation where somebody has a brain tumor or had brain surgery for a tumor? Perhaps they had an acoustic neuroma, perhaps they had a hemangioma, or maybe you had a stroke, 
or Bell's palsy, things that are going on within the brain. Well, now you can imagine the phone lines are doing well, the workers are waiting, but there's no signal to work because the brain is asleep. So what do we do in these situations? We don't have the technology today in 2017 to change the way the facial nerve is inside the brain. But we can do, we can borrow uh, nerves from other places in the face and the neck to provide power to these phone lines, a new boss, if you will. And so if you have an injury here or an injury here, we need to provide power some other way because upstream, it's no good. So one of the nerves that we use commonly is called the masseteric nerve. The masseteric nerve is this nerve right here. It comes down right deep below this zygomatic bone. And this nerve typically runs to the muscle that you use to chew. So when you clench, you'll feel a muscle right here and that nerve typically goes to that muscle. Now what we do is we actually take that nerve and we reconnect it into a facial nerve. And so over time, when you clench, you'll be able to smile. And so we are using other nerves in this area to help with that. Um, another option that we have is called the hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal nerve is a nerve that travels under your jawbone here, and it goes to move your tongue. And what we can do is we can take a portion of the nerve and actually connect it to the facial nerve. So your tongue moves fine, but you also have power from this tongue nerve. So you can see we use nerves from both the face and the neck to reanimate the facial nerve. This is a picture from Hopkins, um, again, with a dissection of the masseteric nerve. These incisions are well hidden. Um, they're they're um, minimally invasive. They're, we use a facelift approach, actually. So we use the same incision we would for anybody getting a facelift, and we can perform these sorts of neural procedures in about an hour and a half to two hours. And it's an outpatient procedure, and you can go home quite quickly. So this is a gentleman who um, had paralysis of his right face, and this was the same man that we saw before with his eyelid, right? So now what we're talking about is his lower face, and you can see he has the stigmata of facial paralysis. He's got the uh, slanted uh, lip, he has the droopy oral commissure, and this is a gentleman who had a masseteric facial nerve transfer. Um, and you can see here on the other side that now his lip position is much better. He has an improvement of his fold. And you can see that when, he, when he's at rest, he looks quite good, quite symmetric. And when he clenches, he's able to really get that smile. Uh, this is another patient of ours um, who had an acoustic neuroma, a very young, beautiful lady who um, also had flaccid paralysis of her left face. And she also underwent a 5-7 transfer, or a masseteric to facial nerve transfer. Um, and I'm going to show you her video, um, because she sent this to me over the weekend. Um, and I wanted to show you how well she is moving. So I don't know if you can see, but I'm going to go back and kind of let you compare the two sides. So you can see here that she's able to clench and smile. And you see again, she's able to bite down and create that nice smile line there. And she's going to show you what she looks like at rest with smiling. Okay? And so that sort of smile, um, compared to what she had before, is all from a nerve transfer. And we're using her own nerves and her own muscles to move her face. So we're going to talk a little bit about the lower uh, face and reanimating the smile. There's a number of different ways that you can reanimate the lower face. Um, traditionally, static slings have been used, and we still do them in the right patient cohort, but we use various materials. Some materials come from your own body, like tensor fascia lata. That's a piece of fascia on the outside of your thigh. And some come packaged in Allerderm or Gore-Tex. And we can use these materials to essentially suspend your oral commissure higher up on your face. And as you can see from the study with uh, Sheris and Lou, you can see that there's a very good result that can result from that. Um, and it's very, very appropriate in the right patient cohort. Now, the, um, the one thing about this is that it's not dynamic. So there are times when you really want to smile or times when you don't want to and you don't really have good control over that because it's always suspended. 
So when we talk about dynamic options, we've already talked about a couple of them. We've talked about the, the repair where we connect the nerve ends together. We've talked already about the masseteric facial nerve transfer, which I've shown you, and the hypoglossal facial nerve transfer. And then there are a few others that we can use. One is called the temporalis tendon transfer, which you may have read about or watched videos about. And then the other is the gracilis uh, free tissue transfer. So when we go back to this chart, we've already discussed about the reversible or acute paralysis. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the non-reversible or long-standing paralysis and how we deal with that. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the muscle tendon unit transfer. And again, that just means temporalis tendon transfer. So the temporalis muscle is this large fan-shaped muscle that inserts here. And when you bite down, you can almost feel it. When you chew gum, you can feel that muscle. Well, that muscle converges onto a tendon onto your jaw bone. And what we do is we can actually reroute that muscle and that tendon to your oral commissure so that when you clench, you can really get a beautiful and profound smile. And so this is also an outpatient procedure that can be done in a very short amount of time. And the the results are immediate. And so this is a very good option. It is dynamic and uh, it's, it's, um, it's a very minimally invasive approach. Uh, we use a single incision and we can either make an incision in your smile line. If you don't have one and you'd like one, we can create one there. Or we can go through the mouth so it's essentially incisionless. And so that's what we do. And here's a p diagram of us looking for that tendon. And below, you can kind of understand how that tendon is attached to the musculature and the tissues around the mouth to kind of be able to suspend up the lip. So this gentleman um, was a, a good candidate for a temporalis tendon transfer. He was uh, not a good ten a candidate for any more nerve work, and he did not want to undergo any long, long procedures. So we performed a temporalis tendon transfer on him, and he is quite pleased with his uh, results. He endorses better uh, eating, he's drooling less, and his speech is much better. There's another picture of him. And you can see already that instead of this flat, uh, droopy lip and lower face, you can see that he's much more readily suspended, more natural, uh, and it looks just more symmetric. This is another patient who had severe facial paralysis on one side, and this is a picture just at the end of the procedure, at the end of the surgery, still on the operating table, and what you can see is immediately you can see that there's been a drastic change and improvement in where his oral commissure is. So one of the last treatment options we talk about, sort of the most um, involved procedure, is something called the free muscle transfer or the uh, gracilis uh, free muscle transfer. The gracilis is a, is a muscle that spans on the inner side of your thigh and we um, are able to take a portion of that muscle with its associated artery and vein and nerve and we can bring it up to the face and make it contract as it did in your thigh but when it contracts in your face it's able to pull your lip up and so this is a wonderful procedure for patients who have uh, had paralysis either on one side, both sides. It's, 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 a, it's a lovely procedure. Um, most patients uh, don't have any problems with walking or any other um, or sports after the procedure. In fact, they're walking the day after surgery. And so it's a muscle with redundant uh, functions. And so patients do fine with us taking a portion of this muscle. So one of the, you know, um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was, well, how do you cause this muscle to move? Well, when we bring the muscle up to the face, we do have to connect the artery and the vein to an artery and a vein in your neck so that there's a, power, a blood supply to the muscle. But the neural input comes from a variety of different sources. Uh, it can come from what we've already discussed, which is the chewing nerve. So if we connect the chewing nerve into this muscle, when you bite down, the muscle will pull the oral commissure and allow you to smile. If we connect it to the hypoglossal nerve, when you move your tongue, sometimes you'll be able to sh see that your, your face will move when you move your tongue, and so we have to kind of train you to um, correlate certain actions to get the right result. Um, then what we can also use is what we call the cross-face nerve graft. And what this is, is we actually go to the other side of your face, so the face that's the side that's unparalyzed, the side that is working well, we actually take one of the facial nerve branches. 
and we connect a long cable to it and bring it over to the paralyzed side and move this muscle. And the thought process behind that is the um, sponta spontaneity of smile will then be translated into this muscle. And that is something we do pretty frequently. It doesn't really cause any problems at all on your good side. Um, and so we can do it without impunity. And then lastly, the dual innervation is when sometimes we will have a discussion with you and talk about doing maybe two nerves instead of one into the gracilis to provide it with power, but also with spontaneity. And that's something we can talk about um, in more detail uh, when we see you in the office. So again, here's a picture of how it would look. The muscle is brought up, it's secured to the upper and lower parts of the lip, and the nerve input, in this case, the masseteric nerve has been inserted, and the artery and the vein have been connected. And so over a period of six months to nine months to a year, you'll see that when you clench, the gracilis is able to move the face. So this is a patient who um, had facial paralysis actually after she was born. She was a baby when they noticed that she couldn't move the right side of her face and over the years she had undergone a number of static procedures to try to sling her face and she wasn't really satisfied with any of them so in this um, in this diagram what you see is that this side of her face seems effaced it seems a bit erased here and she has the telltale signs of facial paralysis you can see that her lower lip is descending and so for her we did perform a facial paralysis uh, surgery with a gracilis and this is a pic video of her before her surgery um, and you can see right now we're asking her to raise her brows we're going to ask her to smile and you'll see that her right lower lip doesn't really move at all you'll see in a second it's really not moving at all here. And we're gonna ask her to smile really big and she still can't smile. You see there's a cant to her lip. There's really no motion as far as her, her lip is concerned. And now if you look on the other side, this is her after her chrysalis. And now look, when she clenches, she's able to move her lip. She's able to bring her lip back. She's able to smile. Um, and her resting tone is in a much better place than where she was before her surgery. So this is the power of, of the gracilis procedure. And I've just taken two snapshots to show you. So on one side, you can see her lip downturned. She's got that paralysis stigmata on the right side. And now she's got a, a nice smile. And when she clenches, she's actually able to really make that a dynamic movement, a volitional movement, something that she wants when she's laughing or happy. So uh, changing gears a little bit and talking about non-surgical um, procedures, well, what can be done if you said, look, I don't really want to have surgery. I don't really think that it's for me. And I think my paralysis has, has recovered to a degree that I'm happy with it, but I want to look a little bit better. Well, there's a lot of options for you. So there's a lot of talk in the media about Botox. Uh, people think Botox is for um, you know, looking like you can't have any facial motion. But Botox is a neuromodulator. It's a medicine that in the right amount will paralyze the exact muscles that you want paralyzed. And so, yes, we do use it for cosmetics. Uh, we use Botox and Dysport. You know, for patients who have wrinkles of their, of their brow, we can get rid of them. People who have furrows or the number 11s right here, when they're crossed or maybe when they're looking at the sun or around, you know, outside under the sun, they might have these furrows. You can erase that with Botox. So Botox is great for that reason. However, in patients with paralysis, the reason why it's so effective is that if you look at this cartoon, when patients have paralysis, this side of their brow will continue to rise every time they're talking to somebody, whereas this side will be completely flat and smooth. And if you have a family member with facial paralysis, look at their forehead right now and try to see that. You'll see that on their paralyzed side, it's very smooth, doesn't move, and on one side there's a lot of wrinkles. And so when patients um, you know, are talking to people that they just first met, they say they notice that my good side is too, too much, it's too active. You know, that's why they think something's off about my face, and they're right. So when the good side is behaving as it should, it looks too much compared to the paralyzed side. And so what we do is we strategically place Botox into the good side of your brow, which seems counterintuitive, but we put Botox into the good side to calm it down to match it with the paralyzed or bad side. 
In this picture, what you see is somebody who's trying to show you their bottom teeth when they're smiling or talking. And what you see is that on the paralyzed side, the lip doesn't come down. And on the non-paralyzed side, the lip comes down a lot. So this is another one of those signs where when a paralyzed patient is talking to somebody, it becomes apparent that there's a severe asymmetry of the lower lip. And in those cases, what we do again is we Botox the good side. We Botox the side that's moving too much and we bring the lip up so that now it's matched with the paralyzed side. And again, these are things that we will talk with you about and fine tune our treatment protocols with you. I just want to touch base briefly on all the adjunctive procedures we do. We are at UCLA have a facial plastic and reconstructive surgery group, group um, division. We have done a, you know, a residency in otolaryngology head and neck surgery where we focus on the head, the face, ear, nose, and throat. And then we do an extra year of subspecialty training in just cosmetic and reconstructive surgery of the face. And so we are well equipped to provide these adjunctive procedures for you. Um, fillers, for example, for the lips, nasolabial folds, we perform that in our clinic. We do fat grafting, um, we do facelifts, um, upper and eyelid uh, blepharoplasties. We do PRP here for face, um, so vampire lift, um, if you will. We do uh, PRP for hair, and um, we also do rhinoplasties here. So some frequently asked questions uh, that I think our patients commonly ask. Number one, do I need to be admitted to the hospital after the surgeries? So I think I've sprinkled this throughout the talk, but really most of these procedures, you do not need to be hospitalized. Really the only one is that free muscle transfer with the gracilis muscle. How much pain should I expect? Uh, it really varies from patient to patient and also your pain threshold. Depends on the type of procedure you had. Most of our patients uh, go home with outpatient medications for pain control and they do quite well. How much time do I need to take off from work? This is really dependent on what kind of work you do. If you are a delivery man and you carry a lot of heavy goods or you work in a um, sawmill or in a place where there's a lot of dust and you can't protect your eye, obviously we need to change the time that you're going to need to be off from work more than somebody who may be at home doing work um, just using the computer for work. When should I start uh, to expect to see results? Well, it really, that's a great question. So with things like the temporalis tendon transfer or the static sling, you see the results right away. I think I showed you a picture where you could see the patient on the table with a dramatic improvement. These nerve procedures are a little different. Nerves grow at a rate of a millimeter a day. So if you imagine a millimeter a day, the nerve is trucking along, trying to grow. And so that can take months for us to see some improvement. And we've seen that it can take anywhere from three months sometimes six or nine months to see improvements in the way the face moves. Um, that goes also for the gracilis. It does take months uh, for it to work. And does insurance cover these procedures? So yes, uh, most of the facial paralysis procedures here at UCLA are covered by insurance. Obviously the, the adjunctive procedures like the, um, the brow lifts, et cetera, you know, the other things that might be done not on the paralyzed side would not be, but uh, we do have many patients who have their Botox covered here, for example, and um, nearly all of their procedures are covered. So that's something, if that's important to you, it would be good for you to come in and, and, and see what we can do to, to help you out. Um, this is our facial nerve program. I just wanted to really br briefly touch on our multidisciplinary team. We work very closely with our um, neurosurgery colleagues and our otology colleagues. So that's Dr. Ishiyama and that's Dr. Gobin. Uh, they are part of the head and neck surgery department, but they are otologists. And we work with the head and neck surgery group as well as audiology. And you can see we have a very multidisciplinary approach to treating you. So we're not pin, you know, um, pinpointing one issue, we're really taking care of you as, as a whole. This is our UCLA facial plastic surgery group here. Uh, we have Dr. Keller, Dr. Blackwell, Dr. Ramsey, Dr. Nabili, and myself. And uh, we are all happy to see you here. I wanted to give a little shout out to uh, Dr. Nabili's webinar that's coming up on Thursday, January 18th. He's going to be talking about rhinoplasty. So please mark that in your calendars and sign up. And that's it. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to answer a few more questions that have uh, arise from Twitter. Right. 
Okay, so number one, how soon should I go to my doctor if I have paralysis? So right away, you have to go right away. You know, the thing about paralysis is that in very unlikely scenarios, some patients have tumors actually that can cause immediate facial paralysis, which seems odd, but there have been tumors that have been growing and one day you wake up with paralysis. And so you have to understand that we need to rule out all these things um, and we want to give you the medications to get better. So we've got to put you on steroids and antiviral medications. So we want you to present right away. And you don't have to present to a facial plastic surgeon, but you should definitely present to your family care doctor or to the ER or anybody who's close by. Um, does paralysis from Bell's palsy always get better? So as we mentioned, you know, most patients, 85% really recover in a significant way where they may never need anything, um, you know, after, that, um, that recovery. Now, patients do develop something called synkinesis. And so what synkinesis is, is when the nerves are regrowing, they miswire. So a nerve that was supposed to go to the mouth meets sprout a branch that goes to the eye also. So when you're eating, you might notice you're squinting, or when you're blinking, you'll notice you're smiling. And so there are two actions going on at the same time, and you want to separ separate them or uncouple them. And one of the best things for that is also Botox. So that's something to think about. But yes, most patients do get better with Ball's palsy. Um, it's been over 10 years since I developed paralysis. Is there hope for me? Absolutely, absolutely. So we've done paralysis surgery on patients who've been paralyzed for upwards to 30 years of paralysis. And we were able to provide them with meaningful improvement with Crystallis procedures temporalis tendon transfers, and a whole other array of procedures. So yes, um, at any stage of your paralysis, we can absolutely help you. Um, and can I also have a rhinoplasty or other cosmetic procedure at the same time as paralysis surgery? Yes, it depends. If we're doing something like a gracilis procedure, that can last anywhere from six to eight hours. And so we're talking about a full day affair for a procedure where we take the muscle from your leg. So on those days, you probably don't want to have a rhinoplasty on top of that. But yes, if we're doing other procedures, we typically can combine these procedures together so that you have one uh, general anesthetic and we can provide you with the results that you're looking for. So thank you so much. Um, we look forward to meeting you and uh, uh, happy holidays and have a great new year.